Hi, I'm Andrew McComb and welcome to Outlier. In this week's episode, I'm in beautiful Nelson, New Zealand, where I'm going to be speaking to Richard Usher, the Managing Director of the Cable Bay Adventure Park. Guys, Richard is New Zealand multi-sport royalty. Let's go and meet him. Richard Usher, welcome to Outlier. Yeah, thanks very much. Mate, you've been a winter Olympian. You've been a uh, multi-sport champion many times over. You've been an Ironman. You've been an entrepreneur, well, you are an entrepreneur, a CEO, and you're also an environmentalist. It's a lot of uh, kudos and a lot of, lot of things you're into, and, and obviously that's what makes you an outlier. You weren't always that. Where, where did it all begin? Um, I guess it's um, it's always been something where I've just never really you know put any boundaries on what I can do, and um, I was probably really fortunate growing up that I had parents that were um, you know they were really su they were really supportive in terms of just essentially letting us do whatever we did. It's a bit different these days, I think. You know, but I remember you know. Growing up in the late seventies, early eighties, like you, you're pretty much just sent out to, to go and roam the streets and build tree forts and and, um, and just explore. And um, I think um, you know we went from a um, a super well-to-do family, but you know the the but they were always really supportive and and basically just said you know go and give whatever you can, whatever you want to do, give it a crack. And um, so I think that was you know probably a big. Um, big empowerment from a, from a young age. And so we're based in Cable Bay here in Nelson, New Zealand. You're, you're originally from Wellington, but your first foray into sport, was it skiing? And, and where, was that in the North Island or the South Island? Um, so, I mean, as a, as a kid, I was into pretty much any, any sort of sport that there, that there was. Mainly it was a great excuse to get out of class. Um, and that's kind of how the skiing started. Um, it's, it's hard being a skier from Wellington because the closest mountains four hours drive away and uh, I went to a, a school called Onslow College where the basically the basis for getting on the school ski team was um, where you're keen um, so I think even in those days like we were hiring gear like to, to get on you know to go when you went skiing um, and uh, yeah it was just it was just a fun time out um, there was probably five of us I think that were that would go up and um, you know, a good um, couple of good teachers that, that took us up there and we got influenced by some, um, you know, some of their friends, um, one in particular who had been a, um, a skier at sort of European level. Uh, and yeah, it was just, it was just a good fun time. You know, we were like, this is way better than, you know, being at school. And um, it was even better when we got stuck on, on the mountain because the, the road got closed because of snow or something like that, which was a fairly regular occurrence. And so obviously it evolved from that though to become quite serious. You went to the Nagano Olympics in '98. Yeah, yeah, went to the um, to the Nagano Olympics, and um, you know I I think it's fair to say that I, being from New Zealand, there's a certain advantage in that there's not that much competition uh, for spots, and uh, you know I um, I didn't ski for that long, um, really in the scheme of things. I think and. When I was 17, I decided that I'd had enough of school, quit school, moved down to Wanaka to go skiing. Um, and I'd probably only done 50 days skiing in my entire life at that stage, so I wasn't as good as I thought I was. Um, so this is your 50 days by the time you moved to Wanaka? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the people I got to know, um, you know, on World Cup and Europa Cup and things like that, they'd probably done 50 days by the time they were three. Mm. So, you know, mm. it's, it was sort of a different context. But, um, yeah, I just, I told everyone I was going to go to the Olympics and I didn't really want to go back to Wellington, sort of with egg on my face going, oh, it's just too difficult. I was rubbish. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I just threw myself into it. And, um, you know, the, I guess I'd seen... Um, I'd seen the Olympics, the, the Lillehammer Olympics on, on TV 
in uh, 92 it was when the um oh, sorry 94 um and and just thought wow that looks cool and that was um for whatever reason um yeah i was just like oh yeah that should be should be possible and didn't really think much more about it just went out to to go and try and do it and um at the at the olympics i was the next skier behind a, a skier called Jean-Luc Broussard who was the he'd won the gold at the Lillehammer Olympics and he was the guy that I'd seen on TV going well that'd be pretty cool and um, so I was the next gear behind him which was yeah kind of was was pretty cool. Fantastic so 50 days leading into Wanaka was it a four-year process for you to go to to um, Nagano and 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 it's not just that the, the the format was moguls too, so that's not exactly easy, is it, compared to normal skiing? Yeah, I guess I guess all of the different skiing disciplines have their um, their challenges, but um, you know, moguls was definitely pretty pretty niche. We were sort of like the snowboarders of skiing at the time, um, and uh, yeah, it was um, it was a huge learning experience. It was three and a half years from when I saw it on TV and quit school to to when. I was ultimately at the Olympics and um, you know I think in that time I skied something close to uh, it was about 300 days a year so you know it was probably close to 1200 days um, and uh, yeah it was basically just total immersion and the um, you know I got obviously got good enough to go there I, I never got good enough to, to challenge the best in the world um, and but it was uh, coming from New Zealand. There was a real lack of um, kind of knowledge and, and coaching and things like that. So I ended up skiing out of Norway for the last year. And um, you know the biggest thing was um, in those days that was before any sports were professional as well. So to go to the Olympics, you had to be amateur. Yeah. So you couldn't even ski in races to like in the pro races to make some money. Or um, it was very very hard to. Um, just survive and um, and, and it was uh, there wasn't uh, really any funding in those days from from a uh, um, New Zealand Olympic kind mm. of federation kind of side of things um, so yeah kind of looking back I think it was probably about as, as good a result with the means that I had that that I could have achieved but um, it was something that I wasn't that kind of proud of for a long time because I hadn't really um, achieved my goal of being um, like a contender and that was always something that um, I guess was when I looked at the success um, for a long time I didn't really view it that much of a success I sort of viewed it as kind of a, a bit of a 50-50 yeah, I'd made it there but I hadn't really um, achieved um, the, the bigger part of the goal which was actually you know do really well at the Olympic environment. Mm. I was a New Zealand beach volleyball athlete, so I'm in the same sort of boat, right? <laughs> yeah. We have to fend for ourselves, and you're half the time stressing about how to pay for things, let alone actually be at training, right? So yeah, we'll talk about that a little later because I think that's really important for the outliers out there. How to when they're starting out, it's a it's a real resourcefulness exercise. But mm. from the Olympics, at what point did you choose to move on and, and get more into the uh, multi sport? Yeah, so um, after the Olympics, um, I went back and the goal was to, to try and go to the next Olympics. Uh, but I, there was just, um, it sort of became a little bit political uh, and there were sort of barriers being thrown up from within the sport that um, I sort of just decided I didn't really need. And uh, I think ultimately um, I looked at the reality of the situation. I think I was doing a, doing a, a year on about fifteen thousand New Zealand dollars, mm. and um, the top guys like Johnny Mosley, who won the gold at um, um, in Nagano, I think has I think remember seeing somewhere that his budget was about one hundred and fifty thousand for US for a World Cup season. So yeah. it was um, it just seemed like it was uh, going to be a um, a constant struggle and. I didn't really want to go back to the Olympics and be in the same or slightly better position. Like, I, if I was going to commit that amount, amount of time, I needed to see a pathway through to, you know, like a gold medal, and um, I just couldn't couldn't see that um, both from that sort of side and and I think ultimately just starting skiing so late in life, um, it was um, 
I was, I was realistic enough to know that um, it was probably unlikely. Mm. Uh, so I um, ended up quitting skiing and um, doing an office job for 12, 18 months um, back in Wellington and um, then ended up um, just realising that, that that wasn't really for me and uh, I'd been on, went on a holiday down to Wanaka just to um, yeah, see some friends and show some friends around and got back down there and just was like, oh, this is where I need to be. And so um, I was on from my job in Wellington and um, I just started um, multi-sport, like coast-to-coast -coast style things, um, you know, while I'd been in that job. And um, so I moved down south. I think I went from making like a good stable salary to thinking, OK, all I need to, I need to earn like $150 a week to pretty much pay for rent and some food and that's mm. all I kind of needed. And uh, so I moved down there and um, not really with any other plan rather than to um, kind of try to keep getting better at multi-sport, but more just to get back to a, a sort of a lifestyle that I enjoyed. Fantastic. Again, another 150 bucks a week. That ain't much these days, is it? <laughs> no, no. I think, um, I mean, yeah, in those days I remember, uh, well I think in the skiing days I remember we paid 25 bucks a week um, for a cabin and usually that we thought that was pretty pricey so we'd usually jam two or three or four mm. people in a room that mm. size and um, you know, so there was some pretty low level rents going on but also some pretty low level um, you know, living conditions as well. Well I was going to say even as a, a budding athlete, an endurance athlete, the nutrition's quite important right so that costs a bit of money. And out 150 bucks a week with rent and food, and that's not going to cut that very well either, is it? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess um, sports moved on a lot as well. Um, you know, it was never really something that I worried about mm. um, back in those days. And as long as we had a few gels for the racing, um, you know, the, it, it was kind of whatever was cheapest to buy. And, and um, I don't think it was re necessarily. Uh, the same as what it is now, like yeah, a lot of things, you know, like just good um, vegetables and um, and things like that were were um, were probably a bit more reasonably priced back in mm -hmm. those days. And you know, we weren't buying a whole bunch of junk and um, trying to trying not to buy too much beer and things like that. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that kind of kept the, the cost down a little bit as well. But yeah, it was um, it was just about being resourceful and um, you know, I guess sort of trying to focus on you know what we're, what we were trying to get out of life rather than mm. um you know what the barriers were mm. so if you think about and i guess for the viewers sake is uh multi-sport and coast to coast what is the coast to coast for those that don't know and and what's the uh, what are the different um what are the disciplines in the sport yeah sure so um multi-sport is a little bit like triathlon um but we're generally the swimming's replaced with kayaking uh, the majority of the races are, are off-road, uh, and the coast, the coast to coast, and uh, is you know quite an iconic race here in, in New Zealand. It, it crosses the South Island of New Zealand. Um, the the main race, as far as participation goes, is the two-day race. So athletes start on the Friday, they do half the course, and then um, and then finish it on the Saturday, and then um, the. I guess the main competitive race is the one day race um, and that starts on the Saturday and athletes go the whole whole way through so it's about 240 kilometres long uh, so in terms of distance it's sort of quite similar to an Ironman but um, it takes about um, the top guys are usually about 11 hours so it's almost a you know a quarter to a third longer than Ironman as far as time goes um, and it's uh, essentially um, road cycling, mountain running and then kayaking, like river kayaking, so um, there's some, some pretty chunky sections in there. So uh, the mountain running in particular, is, is it marathon length or is it like 20k length or? Uh, so the, the run itself is about um, just under 30k, uh, but it is, run, you're basically running almost off track the mm. whole way. So like a goat. Like a goat. You actually go over goat pass. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's um, it's not a traditional run in any sense of the word. So there's been a lot of um, really quick marathon runners and, and mountain runners and that um, go through and, and just not be able to get to grips with it. Mm. And, um, you know, the fastest runners through there um, 
are the ones that sort of have that kind of real off-road ability and you know can pick lines through really broken terrain and um, yeah not afraid to you know be jumping through rivers and um, you know over routes and, and down rocks and that so the run takes about um, just under three hours for the fastest runners um, so uh, not that dissimilar to, to the to the marathon times probably a little bit slower than the marathon times for the elite guys in, in Ironman uh, but the crux of the the race for most people is the river so um, the, the the kayaking section is about 70k long um, down a grade 2 river called the Waimakariri and beautiful beautiful section of river mm. um, but uh, something that not only requires um, all the fitness and strength but there's also a really high skill component to mm. it so um, that's where especially the newer competitors really you know find that that's um, you know the element they have to overcome the most generally. So did you do the two day first when you first got into it or straight into the, the, the long day? Uh, so yeah my first crack at the at the coast to coast was uh, in the two day race um, I didn't really know anyone in that community at all um, I'd seen it on TV again I think and thought oh yeah that looks like a bit of fun uh, and um, yeah so I was just eyes wide open and um, and and just basically going through the process of learning something new and you know that was um, you know probably the element I enjoyed about it the most um, you know was that like learning new skills and, and meeting new people in that in that sort of community uh, and it was um, it was quite daunting even standing on the start line for the two-day race the first time mm. around um, you know it was um, quite difficult to get your head around what it was going to be like when you're standing on that start line looking at going the whole way um, in one day so so that's a really good point so how do you train for that when you haven't done it before um, with the training wise you, you just got to do what you um, give it your best guess really and and I guess it's like anything um, you know any kind of aspirational sort of thing that you've got or any goal like you can only give it your best guess and in the path to get there is always going to be a lot uh, windier than what you anticipate at the start um, and, and I guess that was um, something that I'd learnt um, through the skiing was was a really good um, process just for um, you know having a, a goal and then making a plan and then you know being able to look at it objectively and, and kind of keep revising it um, and I think that was one of the most valuable things that I, I got out of skiing was it sort of set me on that path for just developing a process um, on how to kind of I guess um, succeed in any mm. sort of given endeavour. So again it's an immersion process you spend that time and we haven't told the viewers how many times you won the coast to coast <laughs> yet but five time winner obviously over uh, what was that over how many years nine years was it? Yeah I don't even actually even know how many times I raced but yeah I think I did one two day and, and one team's race and yeah maybe nine or ten um, longer stays uh, so it was, um, you know, a reasonable, a reasonable kind of ratio um, in terms of the wins there, and uh, you know, it was, it was interesting because I, I raced for a while and then I went away to some other sports and then I came back and, um, and it was quite interesting just to see how, you know, when you take yourself out of that environment and then come back to the race, how some of the things that you take for granted like had changed like your skills and you know when you've been training different things and yeah so it was it was always pretty fresh in terms of um the challenge each year and i remember one year um had really lined up to try and just really smash it because i'd won a couple of years in a row and and it was just a complete disaster so it sort of was a good lesson and um you know not changing fundamentals and uh, always um having a bit of humility about the challenge ahead of you. Mm. So what was the change for you when you wanted to smash it? Did you go too hard or? Yeah, I mean, it was um, really around trying to um, look at the run record and, and some of the, um, the records around um, the race. And the one thing about the race is because it's in, in such a um, fluid environment, you know, like going over the mountain, it depends on how high the rivers are and which way the wind's blowing and the same on the river you know the 
the level of the river can impact the speed of the, the race by 30 or 40 minutes and that's totally out of your control um, but yeah just um, yeah the, this, the, this particular year I'd really decided to try and just absolutely hammer the run and um, you know I'd been I'd managed to do some pretty quick times in training but um, when it came to the, the race like I, I basically um, yeah just set out at you know what was probably not really a, a realistic um, with, with a realis- realistic expectation of um, you know what was possible mm. and um, just I guess just ignoring some of the you know the things that normally you would just that I would do um, in terms of trying to achieve that overall success um, and just being just I just wasn't very smart about it so started taking a few shortcuts oh uh, not so much in the <clears throat> in the training um, uh, but it was just probably just trained a little bit too much for speed as if it was like a road marathon and you know so trying to run really fast for a shorter period of time but because of the the nature of the run there's so much such a strength component involved and such a skill component that um, when part of it breaks down it actually it knocked a whole lot of things down mm-hmm. rather than just rather than just getting fatigued like on the road and then just having to back it off a little bit because I'd burnt the legs mm. so hard um, and then you've got that coordination factor is involved as well mm. jumping so, rocks and so then you're less coordinated and so yeah. the effect on your speed is, is you know it's not just one component it's two or three different components stacked on top of each other mm. so um, yeah, and it, it just ended up impacting, you know, the, the entire race from there. Yeah. So that was a good learning experience. So that's on a physical level. What about the mental level? Because the other thing I'm thinking is there's Ironman and there's flat road runners and, you know, marathon runners and that. But once you add the element of rocks and uphill and downhill and, you know, kayaking thrown in, wet socks, all of that, is there a difference mentally in the athletes or is it just everyone learns to deal with whatever pressures and challenges are going on at the time themselves like did you notice they're a bit harder the 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 um multi-sport athletes um i don't i don't think that there was um necessarily a difference in the in how kind of hard the athletes were or um you know the i mean multi-sport in general there was a quite a small selection of i guess sort of professional or semi-professional athletes and a lot of the, um, it was probably a little bit more skill based, but it was also, it was a lot, a lot less, in those days especially, it was a lot less about what sort of bike you rode or kind of how many sponsors you had or, um, it was, it was very much, um, you know, part of the enjoyment of, of training and racing was the environment that you were in. So, mm. um, you know, that was always a really big part of it. Um, and then, but you know, when you when I went to Ironman um, later on, like seeing, you know, like there was truly professional athletes, and and that, like mentally, I think it was a much harder game because it's just so um, it's so one dimensional. You know, it's it's basically you're on the road, you're going, or you, you know, once you get out of the water, and you're just, the the course isn't the challenge; it's the challenge between yourself and your body and your mind mm. so um it was um yeah it was quite a contrast and richard what's fascinating to me is you know 150 dollars a week and you're doing this and you're not from what i understand there's not a heap of prize money and heap of sponsors in that um coast to coast um thing so you're really doing it for the honor and that can be a real burden in itself, can't it, when you're trying to survive on a daily basis as well as survive physically and train as hard as you can? Because you would have trained, what, five, six hours a day at least, wouldn't you? Yeah, I mean, in the early days, um, my body just simply couldn't handle. Um, so, you know, like I think if I did four hours a day, then um, you know, I'd just, I was generally kind of smashing myself into the ground. But, uh, you know, it, it was kind of a, a progression. So I, was, I had a... I, I was working as well, and um, and and it was. I guess it was. I was serious about it, but it was also a bit of a hobby. And um, yeah, there's a, at the time, coast to coast was winner takes all. So unless you won, um, there was nothing. Mm. Uh, and um, yeah, I was really fortunate to 
to pick up you know some product sponsors and and things like that but um you know until you're right at the top of the sport then you know it's pretty pretty slim pickings uh and i guess over the you know over a number of years probably three or four years like i sort of gradually built up um my results and um to the point where I ended up being asked to race uh, by Nathan Fave on um, uh, on his adventure racing team, and that was sort of my first taste of um, you know truly as a professional athlete. We were getting a um, you know we were getting a salary and uh, everything was paid for, and uh, you know that was uh, um, probably what sort of set us more than anything on that um, on that path for the next probably 15 odd 20 odd years, uh, and. Before that, it had just been a gradual process between like work, training, and racing, and then the balance just slowly, slowly moved over time until I, like people, they, I was working at a sports store in Queenstown, and um, they'd call up, oh, "Are you available for work?" And it's like, "Oh, actually, I'm not." <laughs> um, so it, it just kind of it just progressed over a, a period of time, and um, it was it was probably something where. Um, because I hadn't been exposed to that professional sort of side before, um, with the skiing being totally amateur, I hadn't even really given it any thought that it would be a possibility. Mm. Uh, and uh, so it just sort of evolved, you know, quite naturally. Mm. It's a really interesting uh, conversation, though, isn't it? Because there's a lot of outliers out there who want they see all the external things that champions receive, but they don't realise the years of struggle that's gone into it, and it. It can often stop them before they even start going, geez, he's taken, you know, it's taken four or five years for him to even start to get his fitness up there, let alone getting some results, etc. you know. So what advice would you have for an outlier who's starting out in that regard who sort of wants it now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there is no such thing as, as, you know, as instant results or instant rewards for anyone. Um, I've certainly never seen it and I've been exposed to a lot of, um, pretty amazing people over the years and the the one constant is that they've had to push through barriers and that it takes a lot more time and a lot more um, dedication than what anyone will ever see on the outside and that's you know that I think is the only constant um, and anyone that you know it's, it can be really difficult to um, to try and get a good gauge on what people have had to do because um, I mean, nowadays with all social media and, and stories and things like that, a lot of stuff tends to get sensationalised, and mm. and then other people just put stuff out as misinformation. So um, I know it was really common for the for a lot of the endurance athletes to be posting, oh, 60 hours training this week, you know, like just because if the competition got on it and and just decided that they were, that, oh, Jeep is such and such is doing that, I better do that as well. Yeah. And they just smash themselves into Burn the ground. Out. So you did, that, there was all sorts of like tactics. And I remember hearing some really funny stories from, from other athletes where um, I, I think it was Cameron Brown, um, who's a, a, you know, one of New Zealand's top ever Ironman um, competitors and, I remember reading a post that he put up one day and it was something about one of his heroes like Rick Wells or someone like that had said, oh, you know, you need to run like half in the gutter and half out of the gutter or something like that. <laughs> and again, it had just been like, they would just been messing with them, you know. Yeah, yeah. And um, so it, it's, um, I always take, you know, what you hear from, from other other people like that with a pretty big grain of salt. Mm. and. Um, and you, you sort of just need to do a bit of a gut check on it and be like, does that make any sense at all? Or, Well, it's interesting too. Everyone's different, right? So if, if more than four hours training doesn't work for you, you've got to, you've got to listen to that, don't you? Because it's not going to last long if you don't. Yeah, I mean, um, you just end up getting, like I just end up getting sick and, um, and injured. And, you know, it changed a lot over the years. Like, I mean, even now I'd, you know, I don't, I haven't raced for six or seven years now, but I can still go out and, and do more training than back in those days. Like the body's just kind of got that hardness to it after mm. all those years of training. But uh, yeah, you see so many young athletes um, just smashing themselves into the ground unnecessarily. And uh, you know, there's, um, I think especially in the multidiscipline sports where a lot of people tend to look at it as, oh, well, I'm, 
swimming, biking and running or kayaking, biking and running. And so I've got to do like what a, I've got to do like a full kind of program of kayaking and the same for biking and same yeah. for running. And it's just unrealistic. And yeah. I think that's um, the training nowadays the, is becoming a lot more refined when they're realizing that you've got to treat it it's kind of a package mm. and um but uh it's, it's pretty easy to blow yourself out mm. and, and that's well, it's about like, quality isn't it not quantity at the end of the day yeah yeah it's um yeah just just finding that balance and as you say i mean um there's uh one of my biggest competitors in coast to coast gordon walker who um now coaches Lisa Carrington for the kayaking. Yeah, yeah. Um, been a very, very successful partnership, and he's an amazing coach. And uh, in our sporting days, like we would be, you know, like so, so close together. Like we would always be, you know, pretty much within. Um, we'd be able to see each other at the finish line after, um, you know, ten or eleven hours of, of racing, and in every race we did, it was like that. And our approaches were like chalk and cheese. So. Mm. Um, you know, it, there are a lot of different ways to get to the same same position, and yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah. So you five time winner of the coast to coast. You had a foray into Ironman. I think I read somewhere you had the. You've, well, do you still have the best time ever by a Kiwi in a in an Ironman distance race? No. Uh, well, I, I did at one time. Um, so it was actually in a challenge race in Roth in Germany, uh, which is. Um, I think is, is still the largest triathlon in the world, but um, I did 802 um, over there. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been well and truly beaten by uh, a lot of the young guns now. And um, But uh, that was was a, a pretty special day out. Um, I didn't, I sort of, I didn't, didn't do a huge amount of Ironman racing, I think like five or six of them, uh, but it was, uh, the reason to go to Ironman was, it, you know, from the multi-sport side of things, as it kind of felt like a lot of the Ironman athletes were really kind of going, oh, you're not real athletes, you know, the, you guys, like, if you came across to Ironman, you'd just get smashed, and so it sort of just became a bit of a personal crusade to just go and prove them wrong, really. And um, so, uh, but ultimately, I just, I didn't really find the enjoyment in the road racing that, that I did in the in the off-road racing um, and so even um, even the satisfaction of seeing you know of, of getting you know faster and and, and more refined at, at that side of the sport um, it wasn't it didn't get me out of bed every day and and I've, you know sports got is something that it's it's too hard to do unless you absolutely love it yeah exactly yeah so just speaking of that, so at what point did you, the tipping point come from being the athlete to being organised in the coast to coast? Because you became the race director for a few years there, didn't you? Yeah, so uh, I went back to doing a bit of multi-sport and, and racing coast um, again after, um, after Ironman. And I, I still did one or two, I think I did another couple of Ironman races and, or challenge races as they were. Um, and uh, I'd always been really aware that I didn't want to be 40 and an athlete and not have anything else. So I was always acutely aware of having to remove myself from that. So um, I'd actually already moved away a little bit. I'd set up a business called Flow Kayaks and um, we'd been making in um, with a uh, a friend of mine who um, unfortunately is not with us any longer. but. Um, we um, set up a, a company basically making racing kayaks and paddles and um, so I'd sort of been doing that as well as racing and then um, a guy that I knew ended up buying the Coast to Coast um, off Robin Judkins who was the original mm. founder and uh, basically he came and said oh I bought, bought the race what do we need to do to um, to get it um, you know humming along again um, and I think, uh, you know, there'd been a, I certainly felt from an athlete's point of view that the race um, was nowhere near in the sort of shape that it, it could be. Uh, and, you know, it had been, uh, it had been way ahead of its time at the start. It was, you know, like it was, um, 
internationally was like one of the biggest and, and hardest and, and, and you know best races that you could possibly do but uh, you know 30 years later it was essentially the same race you know there was no very little um, um, there had been very little added to it in terms of the athlete experience or the spectator experience or how you can follow it and uh, you know it goes across a pretty remote part of the country uh, and um, and the price had just kept going up and up and up so um, our sort of strategy was just really to um, try and just get the balance back right so that you know, for the money that people were paying and the experience that they were getting, that it was reflective of the, you know, of what the actual race was, um, and also make it a lot more accessible to uh, wider groups of people, um, and and make it a bit more spectator friendly so people could follow it online. Mm. Um, so there'd been all these advances in technology and and things like that that had just never been captured. Did you change the course or the route, or 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 was it more just a case of the technology changes and being more accessible in that regard? Um, we did end up changing the, the last cycle route. Um, it went through, the last cycle goes through the centre of Christchurch and when it had been set up it was basically it went through uh, a route that really made sense. There was only, I, I don't even think there was any traffic lights on it at the time and by the time the race changed hands uh, there were 17 or 18 sets of traffic lights and we went to talk to um, the police who managed all the traffic lights and they were like well to give you an example we set, we put 40 or 45 people on the coast to coast um, race in the route through Christchurch and I think at the time um, was when the um, Wellington 7s were kind of still going and they said oh we give four to that you know and it's so it was pretty disproportionate and the other issue um, that with, with the original route was that um, the police would leave at seven o'clock when the majority of the people were gone through but quite often there was still the top woman racing um, you know for prize money and, um, and and you know so we and it it is classified as the multi-sport world championships and so we wanted to um, you know a big part of it was to try and make sure that the race experience was consistent for everyone mm. and that people weren't um, putting their lives at danger, like chasing prize money and running red lights or mm -hmm. things like that, which um, I know happened because my wife was one of them. But <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so and and so the we basically were able to reroute the course to a different finishing spot in Christchurch to New Brighton Beach as opposed to Sumner, um, and essentially take out all the traffic lights, um, all the um, the police presence went back to about you know four people. Uh, and um, it was just much, much easier to um, logistics-wise, and so the and funnily enough, the course only changed by about 500 metres. So it was really was, um, and that was more by luck than by by design. But um, it's, uh, I think it's it's been um, viewed, you know, as pretty successful that change, and mm. uh, it's certainly um, improved the the athletic experience ac across the board. And participation-wise, it started to sell out, I hear. Yeah, so it's been, um, it's a little bit like what you were talking about earlier with, um, you know, the, it just takes time for things to happen. So um, I was sort of there for uh, five years and we w went from about 450, 500 people on the start line to about 1,000 and they've since got a couple of extra concessions for numbers. Um, and... It took about three, four years, three or four years for it to sell out the first time and it sold out in like November, December and then there was a bit of attrition towards the race and so it was slightly slightly down and sort of the next year it sold out in about three months and then last year about 10 days and this year it sold out in three minutes. So yeah. People, are, they want to get out, right? Out yeah. of lockdown, get out, get out in the bush. So it, it's, um, and that's I guess... Um, Looking back on it, you know, there's lots of things that you know we set in place. Um, that's you know that the the new um, organisers have, have been able to just keep extending on, and um, but it's it's nice to know that we you know played a little part in mm. um, in the I guess the revitalisation of it. 
And so the journey from Winter Olympian to Coast to Coast Champion multiple times over to Race Director and obviously building it up and, and it's, I know it's always been a successful product and a, and a very attractive product, but then you had your time there and you decided from there it was move on and you've set up, was it Cable Bay Adventure Park from there or? Um, yeah, I had, um, well I was running um, Coast to Coast, I was also, I was um, fortunate enough to work in a, um, for a little um, startup that was operating in sort of Sydney and London um, and it was a, um, essentially an um, AI company that was um, had um, developed um, some sensors and some AI around um, coaching progressions um, called Guided Knowledge and um, I got exposed to some, some very, very clever people there and um, a lot of people that had no boundaries on, on where they thought um, things could go and uh, and then yeah uh, you know I, I'd never really um, my goal had never been to, to be a race director or to be involved in, in that sort of side of sports it wasn't something that um, you know I had a, a huge interest in and so I guess I was just sort of looking looking for opportunities and uh, my wife and I decided that we wanted to stay in Nelson, that we wanted this is where we wanted to be based and um, so I was just I was just looking all the time really for opportunities and stumbled across the the adventure park which um, was for, for sale and it was a long it, it was quite a long way out of the realms of our possibility at the time. Uh, but um, from a experience, from a financial, from, from, a, from a financial point of view, yeah. Um, but it was, I guess, it was something that I just couldn't really um, shake, and and so, um, yeah, you know, it was just, it was just something that you know people would be like, oh, what are you, what are you looking at, and you know, so, and it would come up just again and again in conversation, and I couldn't get anyone to tell me it was a silly idea, so. Um, in the end, um, you know, I had a went and had a look at it with with a couple of other friends, and um, had a chat to a mate who worked in the bank, and just said, you know, is, do you reckon there's any possibility that we'd be able to make it happen? And um, he was like, oh, sounds can't see why not. And so we ended up putting an offer in, um, which ended up being accepted. And that sort of started about a year-long struggle around how to <laughs> how to finance it. So um, um, ultimately, we ended up um, having to subdivide a part of the property and bring a um, another family on. That we sectioned that part off, um, and we yeah we leveraged everything we had and um, threw ourselves in, into it. Um, you know, a hundred percent, and uh, you know, so that that was um, the start of that was three and a half years ago now, um, and it's yeah, it's been a a pretty um, interesting ride with all the global developments and things like that. But um, yeah, we we have also been very very fortunate in that um, we've been extremely well supported by Kiwis, um, you know, since uh, the end of the COVID lockdown here. And so the business has actually been able to thrive, um, you know, over the last you know nine, ten months. Um, whereas a lot of the industry has has been hit really, really mm. hard. So very fortunate in that respect. And the Cable Park itself, the Adventure Park, um, sorry, Cable Bay Adventure Park. What are the key things we can do there, as a, from a business perspective or as a as a user can, uh, perspective? Yeah, so um, the park's um, essentially an adventure park. It's somewhere you can, um, people can come for an experience and, and I guess as opposed to a lot of the attractions in Nelson which are like walk or kayak or drink, um, it, it's about kind of you can come and be entertained. So our signature ride's the Skywa, um big giant flying fox that flies across the valley and um, you know, that um, is really what everything's backed off um, in terms of the park. Uh, we've, there's also quad biking here, uh, paintball, and then we've got a, a like, like licensed cafe on site. Uh, we've got another operator uh, who runs archery, uh, and um, we've been developing the whole uh, park into a mountain bike park as well. So 
uh, that's been um, a really big project and one that um, has been taking a lot of time but it's all um, driven off the back of um, volunteers um, from the community coming out and, and, and helping build that and um, that's become kind of a real focal point for our true Nelson locals um, and yeah something that there's still a lot of development to go but um, I think has, has been um, a big part of the engagement with, with the community and um, yeah, and has sort of helped, just I guess helped give us that, that visibility locally. And from a, it's very renowned I believe, like it's not just a mountain bike park, it's, well I mean I've been up there and the terrain's pretty sharp for someone like myself who's a novice, but yeah. you've had some pretty high level riders up there. We haven't really um, advertised it as such, but we're, we're really lucky um, you know that we've that Nelson's got is, is pretty renowned for their high level riding um, and uh, we've also got um, you know people really involved in the mountain biking community like Sven Martin who's one of the world's top fit mountain bike photographers lives just down the road and has been incredibly supportive along with his um, his wife Anka and um, but uh, a lot of the local EWS riders like Brady Stone and Ray Morrison come out and um, we've had um, you know, some of New Zealand's best riders out here, um, like Brooke, Brooke McDonald and Win and Eddie Masters, and um, yeah, just um, yeah, there's been a whole. Um, uh, they just sort of seem to kind of filter through the park whenever they're in, in Nelson. Like they come out and jump on the shuttles, and we've shot a few of the few product releases for for different brands out there as well, and. Um, it's it's just a it's not so much of it's more of a passion side of the of of the park to to the business side, but uh, it, it's it's pretty cool when you you see people pedal off out into the into the hills and then come back with a massive smile on their face. It's um you know it it, um, it definitely gets you pretty pumped to keep pushing and, and keep trying to make the park a, su a success. Mm. And, and one of the things I noticed, you mentioned community before, but it's also you're doing a lot with the, with the natural side of it and the environmental side. Tell us about that. Yeah, so the environmental side, I guess, is something that has developed as our knowledge of the park has developed. So when we first looked at it, it was not really on the radar at all. Um, but like a lot of places in New Zealand, um, the the farming side, you know, has has been really predominantly the use of the land, and sometimes not always the you know the best farming practices. And we've got um, 400 hectares of native um, on the property from true remnant forest. There's about 50 hectares of that where the trees are literally thousands of years old. Um, through to yeah, you've got a few 2,000 years old, haven't you? We saw them the yeah. other day. Yeah, there's some pretty impressive trees on there. Um, and then, yeah, a mix of regenerating stuff from sort of 20 through to, you know, almost 150 years old. So, uh, and and that was, you know, a, a big part of the attraction for us was just in terms of that, you know, the beautiful native forest. And, um, and then um, as we sort of learnt more about it, then, you know, all of these, you start to understand about how uh, poor the health of, the surrounding areas was and, and, and what an issue um, you know the um, single species plantations like you know like the pine plantations and things like that and uh, and and when we saw how engaged people were with with the um, with the native side and, and the things that we were doing there like trapping and you know letting getting people in there on the on the track so that they could see the different things um, and we started to realize that it would be a, a great project to actually try and um, remove and, and restore the whole area back to something like what it would have been um, you know, thousands of years ago. And I guess the difference to what, to what we're doing is that because we've got a successful commercial venture on there and um, the, the mission is twofold, like it's to obviously do all this restoration and get the health of the area back really good, but it's also to provide a recreational asset for kind of people coming through. So whether they're local or whether they're from New Zealand or from overseas, somewhere where they can come and 
walk and bike and explore and appreciate. And uh, I guess I'm a big believer that if you, if people can actually go and experience these areas, then they can see how special they are, and then. Um, they become advocates for it and for its protection. Whereas mm. if it's locked away um, and they and people just can't go in there, it's like you can't go in there. It's special. Um, it's actually not that special for people because they don't get an appreciation yeah, for they it. They don't understand it, do they? Yeah. So, you know, all of our everything we do on there, we try and make sure that it serves dual purposes. So the mountain bike tracks are also trap lines for. Um, you know, we're trapping all the, you know, like possums, rats, stoats, cats, you know, all of the things that, um, you know, destroy our native bird life um, and our forests. Um, and then there are also hunting lines for, you know, removing goats and pigs and, and other things that, um, again, are really, um, you know, decimate the undergrowth and so um, affect the forests. Um, and then all those tracks, like whether it's mountain biking or walking, they're recreational assets as well. And um, we also get a lot of uh, people coming through, like from the schools or um, the education providers, like the Polytechs and that. Um, and so they're also educational assets. And so, so what's the long-term vision with the park? I guess the, the plan that we've got in place is, is actually for 500 years. So we're obviously not going to be around to see that. But um, if you don't, take a view that's that long then you can't restore you know the ecosystem to you know to how it was um, and so you know we're doing our part to get that project started and then it'll be up to other generations to, to carry that on um, I highly doubt the Skywire will be around in 500 years but if people are still mountain biking then uh, there may still will be some tracks through through there be a few e-bikes in uh, 500 years, won't there? Yeah, there'll probably be something we can't even think about right now, some kind of hoverboard or, <laughs> yeah. So when you think back on your journey, you know, it was very individualistic, I guess, or singular focused when you were doing the skiing and then you've just slowly migrating through the process to being uh, more about a company, having vision, etc., to now giving back to the community with a 500-year plan. Do you think... For the entrepreneurs and the young outliers out there that if you look back at the start of your journey that was even on the radar i know you mentioned earlier that it was just evolved over time but like to try to help the outliers and entrepreneurs out there is that something that's important at the start or what would you recommend like at a starting process for for people looking at your journey as an example yeah it's 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 uh it's a really good question and a really hard one to answer um i think that What's important at different stages of your life is um, is quite different, and you know, like people always go, oh, with the benefit of hindsight, I'd do X, Y, or Z. Um, but I also do think that your um, that life's kind of a process that you mature on over time, and that what is important to you at you know what's important to you at different stages of your life is is quite different. So when I was 20, all I cared about was trying to be the best at something and chase girls and have a good time, you know, like it was, that was, that was what I cared about. And, and some people will be different and have a, a much more bigger world picture um, than that at that time, but that was what, that's what I was passionate about. Um, and then, you know, when I got into my, probably as I started to get into my late 20s, early 30s, and I, was, I started to think, well, at some point I'm going to get slow and I won't be able to make my, life, my living as an athlete so what am I going to do and, and so that sort of started the exploration into what could I do from a business point of view uh, and then even from a business point of view um, it wasn't until I understood the particular business that we had um, you know that we had um, become involved with until I actually understood it at a deeper level from being immersed in it for a while that I kind of really appreciated um, what an impact we could actually start to have on, on our community and, and, and how we could run a successful business, uh, but how some of that success would actually be about like giving back. Um, so yeah, I, I do think it, it's pretty individual, but um, I think the most important things are, whatever it is, is that you've sort of got like your dream, like your, like where ultimately if 
there were no barriers do you want to get to and from there then like I always sort of have that as my dream and my that's like kind of my big picture thing like what gets me out of bed in the morning when things are getting tough and then you have your goals and and, and you develop your pathway off that and um, you know the the pathway that you go is always going to be different to what you think is at the start um, as you as you move through but um, you know I, I think that for me that's been pretty pretty solid and it's just given me a, um, a process to work through for for anything I've wanted to do. Mm. I read somewhere you mentioned that one of your mon- uh, mantras or mottos is that every challenge is meant is designed or meant to be beaten so when you come up against a challenge what's your process for overcoming it? Um, well usually there's probably a bit of bloody mindedness at the start just trying to trying to just smash on through it but um, you know, generally, um, you know, at some point, if if you if you can't just push through, then it's about stepping back and and trying to be really objective about the situation, and look at just look at all the different sides of it and see if there's a if there is an obvious route, or um, if not, try and design a pathway either around it or over it or under it or or through it and. Um, and then it's it's just really um, about continuing to revisit where you want to go, and then the pathway that you're on. And um, you know, I guess for me, it's the the um, I just try and always just keep a, sort of a mindset that that nothing's impossible. You know, there there has to be a way to do it. So um, it may as well be me. Well, it's a really interesting point. If, so to me, that's an outlier trait, right? Nothing's impossible. There's infinite possibilities. And there's a, but there's a lot of people in the world who get in their own way and stop their own success, right? Do you believe it's an outlier trait or do you believe it's something that can be taught to, um, to be successful? I think just by nature of how I think, I, th- I would say that there, within everyone there's the ability to achieve whatever they want. But... Um, it's the same as the super talented athlete who isn't prepared to put the hard work in, you know, that you have to actually want it and it has to be part of um, where you want to go. And, and I think that there's a lot of people that they never quite, no one quite, or they never quite push the buttons in the right order to get motivated enough to, to um, you know, to, to achieve something beyond what they would think is possible. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of people who also have these big visions and big big dreams and big goals, but they, I guess their process falls down because they don't take any action or the actions that they take, are, they're not kind of appropriate and, then, and they're always looking at things and going, oh, well, I, I tried that or I tried that. But um, ultimately, I think, like, actions, the thing is, is the defining thing. Um, you can have the best plan in the world and if you don't do anything about it then you'll never get any closer to it so um, and I do think a lot of people um, they'll try one way and then not succeed at it and then be like oh well I tried and give up and probably the outlier attitude you're talking about is not accepting that that's that that's an acceptable outcome it's that, okay, I've tried that, so that doesn't work, so I can cross that off the list and I'll try it this way. And you just, uh, how important it is to you depends on how many times you'll try a different way to see whether you can make it happen. And in that process too, uh, looking back in time, looking at your parents and the values they instilled in you, how important is support in the process, that not only for your journey, but for, for others that are out there and making sure they're surrounded with the right people? Yeah, support is, is really is really important. Um, it's I think it's also something that as you as you sort of start to develop things that um, you'll naturally take people on the journey with you, um, and that if people are inspired by what you're trying to do, then um, you know, you'll develop a network of peers and friends and um, you know who who actually help you know make that journey possible uh, I mean we had a um, I wouldn't say that our family is is super close um, but what our what what my parents 
didn't do was put limits on how we, how we um, thought about things. Um, and that probably was the, the biggest gift of all. Um, but I think it's also, um, you know, there, there, are, um, there are lots of people that have to overcome far more barriers you know, than what I did from whether it's like social or economic or, um, you know, we, we were, as I said at the start, like we weren't particularly well off, um, but we were still a, a whole lot better off than, than some people. So um, I think it's, it's really, um, you know, I think that part of it is, is just acknowledging what um, advantages you have at the start as well and um, um, and then making sure that you don't use excuses that are not really valid and um, and just you know take advantage of of um, of your you know like just be like well it's it's actually you've got to take advantage of your the situation that you're given and um, and, and I think it's a, a healthy perspective to look at it and and look at all the the things that all of the you know all of the positives that you have in your life um, and you know and and you can think about you know there's hundreds of examples for most people of how much worse it could be um, and I think that then you realize that actually you know there's even if you don't succeed in something the outcome is not going to you're still going to be way better off than um, in a lot of other people's situation and so as soon as you realise that it's that failure is at, failure and something is not going to be you know that bad, then it makes it. Um, I think then that um, means that you're far more willing to to take some risks and, and put it on the line. Um, and I guess like going back to when um, when I was skiing and I started off in a multi sport and and we were you know I was living on you know pretty meagre amounts. It, it was that was all the money that I that I had and that I could generate. Um, but it was um, when I quit my job in, in Wellington and went kind of back to that lifestyle. It was it what it, it actually made me realise that um, that what you're doing and 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 how you're sort of empowering yourself to do things is far more important than than whether you're making a certain amount of money or. Um, so I think that. If your if your goals are uh, driven by something bigger than just a financial reward, then they they're a lot more powerful. Mm. So if you were if there was one thing, the ultimate thing that would sum up the one piece of advice or the, the, the that you have observed throughout your journey, other than obviously you've mentioned so many immersions, one commitment, planning, support, um, giving back, legacy, etc., etc. What would it be for the young outliers out there on the start of their journey that you feel could help fast track that for them? Not in a it's not going to take work <laughs> perspective, but maybe it's uh, just a, a wisdom thing that you could share with them. I think this is something, um, I guess it's a, a little analogy um, from a race that I did. Um, it was a Primal Crest race in the Seattle mountains with, with Nathan Fave and um, I think we had Christina and um, might have been Hayden Key. Like there was a, like we had a really um, we had a really good um, race team and I remember we were probably in second or third at the time and on the map it showed us going from this transition riding up this huge mountain and then straight across to a checkpoint and we were with um, another team at the time and we rode up this mountain and we were probably about 10 or 15 k from the checkpoint and the road just stopped and we'd been riding up this hill, I don't know, it felt like we'd been riding up the hill for 6 or 7 hours, like it was a long way and if we went back down the mountain and around the other way it was going to be a couple of hundred kilometres and so we decided that we would just bush bash through the through the forest and get to the checkpoint. So um, about 10 hours later, we were still about halfway from where we'd been to, to get into the checkpoint. And you know, the general feeling was like, well, 
shit, we've obviously made a mistake, but we're committed now, we just have to keep pushing through. But the feeling was pretty, um, everyone was pretty down about it. Another seven hours, seven or eight hours later, we arrived at the checkpoint and we were just expecting, oh, the whole field's gone past us. And what had actually happened is that we were now in the two teams, we were still together, it was with our kind of arch rivals, Nike, and uh, we'd actually passed the other team and we were now in the lead. So I think that it sort of sums up what the journey towards anything that you succeed. Um, there's going to be lots of points where um, you want to give up or you feel like it's um, you, you're just wasting your time or whatever. And, and I think that it's just about, we always had a, um, a um, within the team, basically we, we had an agreement that, that you, the only way you could get pulled off a race course was by medical, like you couldn't quit. And I think just having that, um, just taking taking that off the table straight away, like there's I I can't stop. There's it's no just option. but there's no options. Yeah. There's no option but to see the journey out to the end. And sometimes that'll be successful, and sometimes that it will be less successful. But it will always be a really good learning experience if you look at it in the right way. And and so so what so the way that we always way I always try and look at things is go well if it's bad for for me how bad is it for everyone else um, and you know that you know if you've got that positive mentality and um, you know then and you're looking at things the right way and and you're finding ways to stay motivated then um, and taking action especially you know then then ultimately that's a way a way forward and a way to success. Well, our journey's come to an end, Richard. You've certainly inspired me to be a better person and uh, maybe even <laughs> run on the coast to coast at some <laughs> point. <laughs> thanks very much for coming on Outlier, mate. You're officially an outlier. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Andrew. Well, there it is. I hope you enjoyed this inspiring Outlier TV episode with Richard Usher. For more videos, resources and information, visit us at outlier.tv or connect with us on our social media pages below. I'm Andrew McComb and here's to living the outlier life outside of the comfort zone. I'll see you soon.